Hello and welcome. This is the tenth episode of the Bits vs. Byte podcast. I am your host Amar Grigic, and today my guest is uh, Heini Withagen. He is a CTO at Mirabeau, a cognizant company. Hello. Hi, Amar. Welcome. Thanks. So I would like to start off with uh, with uh, a little bit uh, about you. Mm-hmm. Uh, how how did you get into tech? How did I get into tech? I uh, was always fascinated by by technology and playing around with home computers back in the, well, must have been the mid-80s. So it was kind of logical for me to start studying at Technical University Eindhoven. Uh, started doing electrical engineering there. It was at the time when informatics and electrical engineering were uh, still very much two different departments. But at that time, there were some... Um, uh, some overlap um, between the departments um, existed. And that's when I thought, well, this is an interesting area. So I did both uh, computer science as well as electrical engineering. Mm-hmm. When I finished that with a uh, with a project on handwriting, handwriting recognition at Philips, I thought, well, this is, this is kind of interesting, applying technology to real-life problems. Um, so this was 1992. Uh, then uh, I thought, well, this is kind of interesting, um, um, and 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 I wanted to avoid uh, the um, the public service for the military at that time. So oh, it was still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, so I started the PhD mm-hmm. in uh, neural networks uh, and started uh, developing and designing um, integrated circuits for mimicking neural network functions. So actually building brain-like functions. In really? very cheap, very easy to produce uh, uh, hardware, which is by definition imperfect, like your brain is. Mm-hmm. And the idea was to have a training algorithm over this imperfect hardware to actually let the device do something useful. Okay. Um, so that was great. Uh, what, Great. That was in the 90s already. There was uh, 94, 95, that kind of area. Pretty early. Which at, at that time, neural networks were at the, let's say, the, the, the top of the initial hype cycle mm. uh, and were very much looking for a problem. Mm. Uh, so that, that the technology was there, but there was not really a problem to which you could apply it. Mm. Uh, which well, what happened afterwards with neural networks is that in the late 90s, it kind of died down. And uh, now in the last four to five years, it has regained interest again. Yeah, with the whole machine learning thing. Exactly, like exactly. Um, so um, I did that in the, in, in the 90s. And that was about at the same time that the internet technology emerged so mm-hmm. news groups a gopher i mean this is for the really old people <laughs> who still know what gopher was about <laughs> which was the predecessor of the uh, of the uh, the current uh, web okay uh so when the uh, initial uh, browser technology came out this was 92 93 uh, I immediately picked it up and started playing around with it. Mm-hmm. And then then the university turns out to be a great uh, playing field and experimental uh, place. Mm. So I got the freedom to actually play around with all this new technology. So I started playing around with web servers, databases, uh, browsers, everything around it. And, and uh, well, th- like I said earlier, the application of this technology to 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 useful real real life problems that mm-hmm. was the trigger for me yeah so when i finished my phd in neural networks i said okay doing research at a very very minute level i mean it's just one thing yeah. it's one thing and you can talk to about 25 to 50 people around the globe on this subject mm. which is you're very specialized but and 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 the uh, the goal you're trying to achieve is probably 15 to 20 years out there. I mean, this is what this was really basic research. Yeah, uh, and I thought, well, might be not for me. I'm more of the application type of guy. I want to apply technology to a real world problem. So that's when this new internet technology came about. Yeah. I thought, well, let's start playing with it. Yeah. Let's just do it. And and that's how also how Mirabeau started probably, right? From that yeah, kind of notion. Initially initially I uh, I joined a, a small company which uh, um, did some really cool stuff uh, with this new technology for a number of banks. So we for example built the first generation of Postbank, the predecessor of ING, 
the Netherlands, the first generation of post-bank internet banking with really, really early day uh, technology, which was at some point really, really crap. Uh, but it was a great learning school. Mm. And that led to the start of Mirabeau in 2001. Okay. And how did you guys start out? Because there were multiple of you, right? Uh, seeing yeah, the I founders. Would, yeah, yeah. We're, we were with four founders and we knew each other from previous work. And I think we had the, I'll quote, quote, ideal mix of skills. Mm-hmm. I had a technical background. One of the co-founders, Eric, also had a technical background. Adjan was more the creative guy. And Gottfried was the uh, the guy with the project management skills. Mm-hmm. So with the four of us, we had, as let's say, the DNA of our company uh, had all the different skills in it. Yeah. Uh, and while we also knew that the type of, of projects we wanted to, to work upon were uh, would be... V- a lot bigger, mm. we at least understood what the importance of the different elements in those projects would be. Technology, creativity, making sure you spend the money wise. Uh, that was all inside of us. So that was the core of the company. Yeah, And I guess that formed the right soil to plant in different seeds um, uh, new people, yeah. customers to to actually let that grow. Yeah, because I can imagine that uh, when you're hiring uh, maybe the first employees that you had, it was easier because all, all of you had that uh, particular skill set, right? Exactly. Yeah, so if so, you were looking for a developer or whatever, you knew, okay, uh, I know what to ask him and exactly, stuff like that. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so and uh, looking at what Mirabeau does, so what do you actually do? Because I know it started out as doing like uh, web applications or uh, websites in in most cases. Yeah. Um, uh, has that changed a lot, or is it still a little bit of the, of the same? How, how would you describe it? Um, yeah. The, in the first years, it was basically web applications, and and already pretty quickly, um, those became business critical web applications. So uh, uh, e-commerce systems, uh, applications where orders or money flows flows through yeah and um that part has always been the same business critical but the the way it's being exposed to users is i would say the thing that changed over time i mean obviously at some point um the iphone came about or mobile phones in general and so then mobile applications were one touch point as well uh, for example, now we see an explosion of possible touch points with users, ranging from voice to augmented reality, mobile phones. Just just about everything could be your touch point mm. at any point, and uh, that's the interesting point now in time. I would say that the the cost of technology and the pace with which new technology can be applied mm. is so rapid that. Well, anything could happen. If we would uh, imagine that we want to change this room into a smart room Mm. and have uh, ceilings and walls and glasses and doors uh, uh, play a role in the interaction with whatever you want to achieve, then we can do it. Mm. With reasonable amounts of reasonable amounts of money, yeah, yeah. So the things like AR and uh, stuff like that, exactly, and. Looking at the clients, so uh, what what kind of clients do you see um, that you guys service at the moment? So uh, w- what do I have to think about? Is it like I- more in one sector or it's like all uh, all over the place? Um, I think that, that to be successful for a client, you need to make sure that you understand their business. Mm-hmm. Once you really understand what's the key element in retail or the key element in, in travel and hospitality or maybe even more specific in an airline industry, when you, you, when you are able to absorb that industry knowledge, you can really make a difference for that client. If you just, quote, quote, know the trick of implementing an iOS app and you have no clue on how the business of your client is actually uh, um, build up, mm. then you get a. Yeah, it, it's a tough job uh, explaining to a client why you can be relevant for him, especially in the long term. Yeah, yeah. I think what we've done is on a certain number of industries, travel and hospitality is one of them, uh, financial services is one of them, and retail, we've invested in making sure we know so much about 
this industry that we become a the right discussion partner for our clients. Yeah, so uh, you you probably invest a lot in, uh, of course, you have your clients that you already have, but you're also looking at how the market is developing, right? And what kind of um, what kind of challenges are within a particular market? Right? Exactly, and yeah. and and it's also interesting to see there that the, the the new innovations or the application of new technology doesn't happen in every market at the same time. To take an example, airlines have already been since I would say the late nineties been involved in e-commerce, selling mm-hmm. tickets online, yeah. while the retail industry has, well, uh, depending on what, what you measure, but for, let's say from, from 2008, 9 or 10 on, they've really caught on. And well, in the, in the most recent years, this, this has ob- obviously gone through the roof. Yeah, you can't have an e-commerce. Almost no one has an e-commerce without a w- website, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, and now, for example, you see that in the, in the B2B, in the business-to-business industry, this is really catching on, while 10 years ago, people would have said, well, what are you going to do? You're going to sell uh, uh, lawnmowers or, uh, I don't know, or whatever kind <laughs> of... He- washing machines. Yeah, or- ha- wa- washing machines or uh, any kind of heavy equipment through, a, f- through an e-commerce platform. Y- you're crazy. Yeah. And it, it is catching on. So you also have to know or at least find out. Knowing in advance is, is pretty difficult, but you need to be aware that you need to find out if the application of a certain technology in an industry is relevant at, at any point in time. Yeah. Um, to, to take an exa- another example out of the airline industry, it is difficult in a plane to add extra hardware. If, mm-hmm. you, if you would have a great idea and say to an airline... Wi-Fi. For example, uh, for example well, yeah. it, it turns out to, it's going to take time. And, and from a general availability of the, this technology, it feels kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, we've had Wi-Fi since, I don't know, uh, t- t- a almost lot, 20 years. A long time. A, yeah. a long time. And in airplanes, it still turns out to be quite difficult, which is because of the, all the regulations around uh, safety mm. to make sure that this plane is, is certified and, and you are comfortable stepping into it and, and taking a safe flight. Yeah. Um, so knowing the limitations and the and and the the day to day operation of a certain industry, I think is key to being successful there. So that's what we invested a lot in, and I think once you do that, uh, and you are able to attract a number of clients there, you, in return you get the recognition from the industry. And say, hey, these guys really know their their shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to. Uh, and 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 so if I if I uh, as as a client in this industry have a problem, I at least should start talking to them. Yeah, and is that also uh, part of uh, when someone becomes a new client? So do you like uh, do that research within the project that the client? Uh, so do you have like a pre phase that you uh, depends? Go through or? Yeah, uh, it depends. I mean, in some cases, we 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 come into contact with clients and say, hey. Um, we don't know your industry yet, but we, the, the type of technology, for example, something like augmented reality, mm-hmm. you want to apply, we know really well. And we, so we are not the experts in your industry, but we are, in this case, the experts in, in augmented reality. And we want to apply that together with you in your industry, but mm-hmm. we are open and honest in that we don't know what your industry is about. Or the other way around, we know your industry very well, mm-hmm. and let's start experimenting with a new field of technology. For example, in the case of voice, Transavia was our long-term customer since 2007. And together with them, we made the first steps with the Amazon Alexa and also with the Google Home to start experimenting with how would a voice interface fit into the overall customer experience. Yeah, And that was really an experimentation phase where both us, Mirabeau, and Transavia were open and say, hey, Let's start experimenting. Because yeah, because we don't know where it's going to go. or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, this, this is a completely new field. Mm. And from a client perspective, so from Transavia, Transavia's perspective, they could have said, well, let's not do that and wait until this technology has matured. And other t- companies have already done it. And exactly. Like that. Yeah. And, and I think that, and this is more a, 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 a general topic, um, Innovation right now is is trying stuff out. Mm -hmm. And as the technology building blocks have become so cheap and accessible, 
you don't need hundreds of thousands or millions of euros for innovation anymore. No. You rather need a few weeks and a couple of 10,000 euros to start experimenting. Yeah. And any sizable business should actually be obliged to do that. Yeah. Because if you don't do it, you're behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- that's where uh, uh like that's where companies like Google, Amazon and Microsoft come in, right? Because they have those kind of building blocks Absolutely. to get that innovation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, going, we, yeah. we we build up on the technology of others. Mm-hmm. And like you mentioned, Amazon, uh Microsoft Azure, uh, Google, those provide the building blocks to really propel new innovation yeah because you uh work together with them a lot right so you have uh, i think there is some kind of uh partner status that you have with them right yeah yeah i mean we 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 think it's important i mean it's it's great fun i mean you here in your company you're trying to develop products and 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 being busy with the let's say the nitty-gritty details is really super important and it's also super fun yeah, to yeah, actually dive upon yeah but you also know that it takes time to actually then build out the full scope of your of, of the end product mm. if you really want to innovate you can't start with a complete blank sheet and then say okay we're going to do everything ourselves we're going to build up the infrastructure we're going to build up the databases we're going to build the application layer we're going to make sure the scaling is okay we'll take care of the hosting obviously you can but it's going to take time mm. so what we believe is that making use of the of, of the building blocks which are already out there and using them as the quote quote lego to build quickly build your own application mm. sometimes for an MVP, a minimal viable product, just to test stuff out, or sometimes as 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 the foundation for a much larger platform. Okay, yeah, I, I can see that because we we have that same thing with uh, with what we do at uh, at the Vrede on the Now is that um, we want to be able to be uh, we want to focus on the application itself, Absolutely. right? We yeah, want to exactly. bring the value to the customer uh, and. It doesn't make sense to us to <laughs> reinvent the wheel, right? Exactly. Because it, if we want to have, for example, we talked a little bit about natural language processing. If you want to have that, you can go to Amazon or Google. It's a little bit difficult for Dutch at the moment, but yeah. uh, for English, for example, you can already do it. You can but, just. But, uh, run but again, through. from a pure research perspective, and like I just mentioned in the beginning, I've been in research. Yeah. It's super interesting. Uh, to actually develop natural language processing. Yeah, yeah. But it's taking time. Yeah. I mean, this, the, especially if it's a new field, you have to expect that you're going to spend years on actually making progress. Yeah. And, and, and right now, on, on the business side of things, um, companies like okay, KLM or Transavia or Ahold or Shell, they don't have the time and money uh, to, to start spending on, on these kind of projects. Yeah, they, to create a whole neural network or whatever. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and while this, this might be true um, in the case of Shell uh, for, for, for the energy, energy transition to, to, to finding out new energy resources, there they, they definitely will spend a lot of money. Yeah. But on the, on the customer uh, experience side, Shell is not the type of company to start doing fundamental research on user interaction. No, yeah. you just want to make sure you, you're making progress there and provide the right type of applications and touch points to your customers. Yeah, and make, and make it maybe even easier for people within your company if you have like internal also, applications. And also, the, and this, this works both ways. Uh, um, yesterday, I, I attended a, a talk by Peter Elber from KLM, and, and he mentioned, you all know... KLM from for from their great um, exposure on, on on great social media campaigns, uh, being at, at the forefront yeah. of of digital interactions with the customer. But he said, "Yeah, we realized a couple of years ago that we kind of neglected our own employees. We mm. alienated our own employees because we went so fast with digital on the consumer side that the employees were actually felt were left out." So they've been doing a real catch-up in, in the last couple of two to three years to really make sure that you balance the type of engagements you have with your employees with what you do for your customers. It, because it, it starts to feel rather odd when a passenger of KLM st- uh, steps into a plane mm-hmm. and is hyper-surfaced because he has a KLM app and everything is at his fingertips, 
while the cabin crew is there with a the paper printout. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and and, and, and scrapping off. Okay, passenger uh, number, uh, passenger armor is on board. Uh, passenger Withagen is on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it 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 doesn't it doesn't mix. I mean, yeah, it doesn't it, make sense. Yeah, and and especially and this is. Uh, this is also from a brand perspective. If you as a passenger are on that plane, it does not compute in your brain that on the one side it feels very digital because you as a passenger yeah. is, are, are treated very digital while you see happening that the rest of the company is not there yet. That doesn't compute. Yeah, so you have to make sure, and, and it, this is all in the yin and yang and balance side, you have to make sure that this is balanced as well. Yeah, yeah because... I I never never uh, I was also always thinking about it. why why are they doing that with those paper printouts right I mean why what why are they even doing that because they're already scanning your ticket so they you know you're there right Yeah it, I mean I mean especially in the airline industry obviously it boils down yeah, to, to to procedures checking and again. checking again and again and again and again Yeah um but but now we and this is coming back to technology and 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 the the reliability of technology has become so good mm. that at some point it becomes inexplainable why you are still stuck with old procedures old systems paper yeah. while there are very good alternatives yeah yeah and i can get it from a from a checking perspective i Absolutely. can get that uh, completely but uh, it, as you said, it doesn't make sense that uh, your employees are left out uh, within uh, technical innovations. But, for example, your client is getting all the innovations that exactly. they want. Exactly. Right? So, so, so recently, um, I would say in, in the last couple, three to four years, we have done lots of projects which were mainly focused at employee experience, okay. making sure that the employee, employee, an employee gets more empowered to do his or her job the in right a better tools fashion, and, uh, with more fun, mm. uh, a better result, more predictability, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And uh, if we go back mm-hmm. uh, about, uh, I think about two years ago, um, there was a thing that uh, you, uh, your company or the company you co-founded was acquired by uh, Cognizant. Cognizant, yeah. Yeah, or Cognizant. Yeah. yeah, it's always a little bit tricky. How the, <laughs> yeah, it's how always. The, uh, so Cognizant. So yeah. I, I was, I was wondering, uh, what kind of impact did that have on your, uh, on your business? So what, what, uh, what made uh, that step happen, and what, what, what did it uh, deliver for you guys uh, uh-huh. as a company? Well, we we noticed that while Mirabeau was a well, pretty sizable digital agency in the Netherlands with about 300 people, we felt that the, 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 the rapid pace of new technology, well, we, we already mentioned a few, yeah. uh, the, 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 the rise of augmented reality, virtual reality, voice, uh, blockchain, I mean, this is going uh, all over the place. All over <laughs> the place. Um, and and the, uh, let's say the role we want to play for our customer customers, it turns out that it's Pretty difficult, even with a 300 people company, to be able to cover all that. Mm. So we were looking for solutions to be able to. When a customer comes to us and says, "Hey, could you help me solve this particular thing?" Yeah, particular thing uh, in the uh, company uh, customer or the company uh, co- company employee experience interaction. Could you help me? And and um, whatever uh, whatever type of technology is necessary to apply. Make sure you have it in your bag to be able to apply it, mm. and and so we were we were really actively looking at how can we solve this puzzle, and then uh, uh, we met the guys from Cognizant, and and well, obviously this is this is a very big company, uh, about two hundred fifty thousand people, with with a presence all over the world in all kinds of technologies. I mean, if you look at the, the list of partnerships of Cognizant, it's endless. Mm. They have partnerships with just about everybody in the software industry, which is, well, if you look at it from, from our perspective, which is the, let's say, the perfect playground to be able to have all the building blocks available mm. to, to build solutions for our clients. Mm. And, uh, um, um, we and and obviously the, the 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 likes of Cognizant and Accenture and and TCS and well obviously there are a, a bunch of them. Um, they were also active at our clients. 
So they were also at the same time a threat to us, yeah. in sense that they were claiming Maybe, yeah. to be to be able to 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 offer that kind of of um, of services as well. So we needed enough, let's say, meat on the bones, uh, enough sturdiness to be able to to uh, resist that that fight uh, at our customers as well. Um, and then uh, it turned out that the the way of working and and uh, the, the type of customers. Uh, we're focusing on was very much aligned between us and Cognizant. So we just said, oh, let's give it a shot. Yeah, so let's so, do it. Yeah, it was a logical progression from going from uh, yeah. 300 people to uh, not maybe uh, your company maybe didn't grow that much in that sense, right? Uh, Correct. You don't have um, a lot more people at uh, Mirabeau at the moment. Correct. Uh, But it's more like the resources part. So if a client comes with a particular case that you didn't do before, uh, you you have like a, you could almost call it like a big brother behind you that can uh, can give you those resources or has that capacity. And and also to make sure that we were able to expand in certain markets, for example, in the the airline industry, where we were covering 100% of all airlines in the Netherlands, which is not that difficult if there are just two. Yeah. Uh, but so if you then want to expand, you have to go abroad. Yeah. And, and doing that on your own, we did that in, in, in 2014, 2015. We did work for, at that time, already Air France and China Southern. Uh, so we were on the, on, on the journey of expansion. But now together with Cognizant, we do work in the Middle East, in the, in the Scandinavia, South America. So it's, it's really propelled our presence in that market, mm. which... We might have been able to do on our own as a standalone Mirabeau, but, yeah, but it would have taken time. a lot longer. Yeah, because you need to kind of build that trust with the, those kind of big companies, right? You need to be able to show them that you can actually do the work exactly. that they want to have. Exactly. So, and if you then come in as a small Dutch firm in the in the Middle East, yeah, uh, it, it's it's taking quite some effort to actually make yourself. Uh, trustable. Yeah, because a company of three hundred employees, for example, at the time of uh, yeah. uh, at the time of the kind of acquiring uh, by by Cognizant, uh-huh. um, it, it's pretty big in the, in the Netherlands, especially when you look at the design en- agency market, right? Uh-huh. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty big, but uh, for <laughs> for other parties outside of Holland, it's like. Yeah, it's, it's zero, almost non-existent, no, right? No, and so so it's very interesting to see that within Cognizant, we are part of a bigger network. Where in the UK, in Germany, in Canada, in Australia, s- s- companies very very similar to Mirabeau, mm. also digital agencies, are now in a kind of network setting to be able to. Uh, make use of each other's um, um, presence in that geography mm. when it is required for certain clients. Yeah, so that's a, a little bit of their strategy as well as a, yeah. a cognizant, right? Yeah, and, and, and that's things. not uncommon. I mean, that that's what you see with with several of the of the of the global players. I mean, WPP does this in a slightly different manner. Uh, Accenture does this in a certain manner. So it's 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 a it's a a model which is very very common. Mm. Yeah, because you need to kind of work together to get that body of uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and w- what has changed in your role? So, how, how is it? Is there a real uh, difference between what you were doing as Mirabeau as a standalone company or as a part of that uh, Cognizant family? Um, not really. I mean, we we uh, within Cognizant we are part of Cognizant Digital Business, mm. which is a let's say a superset of the type of services we offered as Mirabeau. So we are, we are, were a typical uh, digital agency, uh, which is now complemented in digital business with guys who have deep and, and broad IoT knowledge, uh, uh, and uh, analytics, so d- data analytics, data science, uh, artificial intelligence is also part of that group. So in the Netherlands, we are now with, uh, I guess, about... A couple of hundred guys, girls, uh, working in this area, and and we can we can deliver end to end from digital strategy all the way to ha- making this happen and, run, and running it for you. Uh, we can offer, mm. and so in that sense, well, yeah, it's 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 uh, it, it it provided us, let's say, and and me then personally in my role with the the missing pieces of the puzzle, which. 
Well, I, I wasn't able to offer uh, before the acquisition. Um, uh, to, uh, as an example, we don't, we didn't, as Mirabeau, have any um, CRM expertise. Mm. Uh, while in more and more customer experience platforms, if you now get a customer experience RFP, CRM is definitely in there. Yeah, of course. So you need to be able to reliably and trustworthy be able to answer those kind of RF- RFPs. As Mirabeau standalone, we were not able to do that. Yeah. Okay, we could bring in a partner and have a, a kind of combination with other parties. Mm. Uh, right now, we can all all offer this with one brand, with one team, and one responsibility to our clients. Yeah. For so for you, it's also been easier to get that kind of expertise, right? Because you can just say, okay, I want uh, I want something. For example, the CRM uh, part. Uh, do we have that somewhere within our organization to uh, to sure. get that uh, absolutely to get that over and uh what what do you see as your like main um main focus as as a cto at at mirabo so uh, what what uh, of course it's a little bit i think uh, talking about what you guys do and uh, stuff like mm-hmm. that right mm-hmm. uh, w- what are other parts that uh, that uh, yeah that you do within your role so i would say i i we we and th- th- this is also not uncommon for other uh, other uh, companies. We strive for long-term relationship with our customers. Mm-hmm. And what I find very valuable to bring to a customer is that we can be their conscience, and in my case, the technical conscience. Okay. So, dear client, we're proposing a certain architecture for you, and we'll guard that architecture for you. We'll make sure that over the years, this architecture stays up to date. It stays relevant for your business, and we'll make sure we update it at the at the right time. And obviously, this this comes with lots of contractual stuff around it on the, the on, on the type of engagement you you're, you're setting up. But if if it's a if it's a good relationship and there's really trust between you as a service provider and the client, uh, I want to be able to say I can guarantee that I'll be that conscience for you. Mm. Uh, so that, that's, that's the, in, in a very broad sense, the, the role I, tr- I, tr- I try to play and to make sure that whatever we propose to a client from a technology standpoint, that it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's a logical um, proposal given the ask of the client. Yeah, yeah. and do, do you also feel like you are a little bit of a... In some cases, a little bit of a translation layer as well. To uh, sure, for example, it's, it, 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 exactly. Well, this is where we started when when I said I didn't want to stay in into into uh, scientific research mm. because I felt that the the application of the technology for a real world problem was the gap between there was too far. Mm. And what I'd like to do, and and I hope that that people also feel that I'm quite good at it. Is, is making that translation, mm. hearing what the problem is and then peeling that off and saying, okay, now I really understand what you mean and this is, this is what a, 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 a typical solution could look like for your problem. Yeah, and, I can, and I can um, provide you arguments why this might work for you. Yeah, because I can imagine on a level that uh, you're talking about, so you're probably talking to other directors of uh, companies and stuff like that, yep. and maybe they don't have that uh, technical no. uh, background, right? So yeah, is it, that also that's also I think a, a, a part, right? So translating it to maybe normal people, yeah, yeah, <laughs> talk, uh, right? The de- technifying this is not a yeah. word, but you get the you yeah. get the you get the idea. Is 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 getting the getting the, the, the complexity nitty gritty details out of the conversation and explaining in normal human language why something is useful or why something is complex, and then together with the client uh, determining what the what the, the best steps forward is. And this this I must say this role has changed over time. I mean, if I look at the last fifteen years, when at first. We, as digital agencies, I mean, this is not uh, strictly true for us. We, as digital agencies, were trying to explain to customers very new stuff. Yeah. Dear customer, this is new, and we think y- it, it could be very useful for you. This is a website. <laughs> this is a website. And we we'll say, okay, website, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, right now, 
in more and more cases, the, the, the people on the client's uh, side are very much mature as well. I don't have, I have to explain to them what certain technologies are yeah, because yeah. They, they know it at least at the same level as I do. So it's much more of, of being the right conversation partner and together finding out what we're going to do. What they're going to do. And then I would say um, what we, what we uh, often use as what, what can we bring to you, dear client, it's bright ideas and brilliant execution. Mm. And the mm. bright ideas, they might come from us, they might have come from the client, and the brilliant execution, we got to form together. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but but for, uh, that, that, uh, I would say that's, that's for, quote, quote, mainstream technology. Mm. Uh, we already uh, slightly touched upon uh, new innovations like voice, for example, yeah. where it is right now actually the same as internet technology 25 years ago was. This is completely new. Mm. Nobody exactly knows where this is going. Nobody knows how this is going to be applied in everyday human to human and human to machine communication and we need to find out Mm. so we'll be there will be new experts again and and we'll have to explain to people why this is complex or why this is interesting to actually start working with yeah and how i mean right now we and and uh, 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 let's say everybody above a certain age let's say everybody uh, above 25 I would say is right now completely focused on screen interaction. Yeah. We've grown up with being focused on screens. Yeah, That's we have our, computers. Everything is with a screen. Phones, yeah. While this is obviously just a part of our uh, the, the, all, all, all our sensory input, uh, we have voices, we have ears, we have, and, and we haven't even touched upon smell and touch. Mm. Uh, Right now, the next level that's going to happen is voice interfacing. So we're, um, uh, cre- we have the technology to be able to use our voice to interact with the machine. Yeah, and that, that's an interesting point because that, that leads into my next question as well. Is uh, You started out creating websites and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you think that, that future will... Uh, where do you think we'll go in the future with uh, in regards to websites? So do you even think that... Um, in the future, we will have websites, or is is it is it something that's that's going to change? Because you are already talking about the voice interface. Yeah. And, uh, what what do you think about that? Um, um, yeah, I think web- websites, as such, were just a let's say a sign of the times. At that point, we had the build the the, the Lego blocks to be able to build something which we call a website. Uh, I believe it, it, it'll it be much more about screen interaction. Okay. We'll have screen interaction and whatever's, whatever delivers that screen to, that, um, to, to this wall or to the screen next to us, I don't really care. We, we could call it a website, it could be an app, it could be whatever type of application, it could come out of the cloud. Um, it's going to be screen interaction. So I, I think websites as such, yeah, they'll probably disappear. Mm. And and we'll have all kinds of other fluent, uh, let's say, o- um, uh, fluent steps in interactions. I'll start talking to my phone, mm. and somewhere in this conversation, the phone or or the, the interaction might require a visual representation. And at that point in time, a nearby screen could be ah. my phone itself, yeah, yeah, or yeah. could be a screen on the wall, or could be the wall itself will be my display interaction. Yeah. And once it's not necessary anymore, this screen will disappear again. Yeah, so your interfaces will also change a lot, right? I mean, you, you could say, and, and there's been lots of research on this, is that we'll have m- much more fluent, fluid interfaces, hmm. which are only there when you need them. Yeah. And they'll disappear. I mean, you, you've probably seen examples of holograms, yeah, yeah. Of, of, of projections on your skin, where just for that moment, for that interaction, we'll use that surface to interact. Mm. And after it's gone. Is that called a website? In my, no, well, in my yeah. definition, not. It's, no, it's, no. it's a temporary screen interaction needed at that point in the user interaction. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's just an interface, right? It's just an interface at some point. Yeah, and it's just an interface to do something and, in and that process. What, what I think what we've done in the early days of the internet is that we 
perfected the application of that HTML and HTTP technology to to really build out an industry. And, and we've yeah. plotted e-commerce and, and all kinds of other service interactions on that technology. Uh, but but it I mean we, we we we've all been there that 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 we felt okay but the the, the way we apply this technology is not, it feels a bit strange I mean mm. HTTP and HTML were not built for all kinds of e-commerce applications they were built for something completely else for knowledge transfer yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. having yeah. and having hypertext. Uh, uh, actually, if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia is actually the classic case for what, what the, the internet in, what was. the internet technology was built for yeah. yeah information links between them that's it mm. and we've been able to really pull the max out of 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 the website technology to have a, have an whole industry uh, around us yeah but I, I i would say the next level would be much more on on screens which are popping up wherever necessary yeah and in combination with that voice right in, in voice combination and, with and voice. Uh, what i just mentioned i think the next level is going to be um something we haven't even even, even touched upon is is remote smell mm-hmm. we have no idea yeah it, it's it's i mean there, there are some very small experiments where you can yeah. uh, buy some small odors with some some uh, some electronics over it and they produce can, some kind of smell but this is just child's play. Yeah. And the same holds for remote touch. How are we going to fix that I want to grab something and that I can that somebody else can actually feel that I'm doing that? Yeah. I mean re- re- imagine that we're in the 1800s and nobody ever saw a television. Hmm. That would be crazy for them, yeah. Exactly. And so when I'm saying to you we're going to have something which is remote smell and remote touch in the next 50 to 100 years mm. it's it's it it crashes your brain on a, a actually getting around that and saying oh, yeah. how would that work and and what kind of devices are they going to be we don't know yeah there, there are some some applications but they kind of still need uh, something else to pass that uh, movement through it right yeah. so you have like the surgeons that do kind of weird or not weird they do kind of complex uh, operations on like a thousand miles away for right? example they're doing it through a robot or whatever yeah so uh, so like the transistor the invention of the transistor the basis of all these electronics we have around us that sparked the the, the start of the microprocessors and mm. the, the miniaturization of all kinds of hardware Imagine that in 10 years' time, there'll be an invention which might, might make our skin um, touchable remotely. Hmm. Could happen. Yeah, or it, Then it, a whole new industry might emerge where interaction between humans at a distance hmm. will go to a whole next level. Yeah, because there, there are already kind of steps uh, going through that, right? So you have like the thing with uh, uh, what Google did with the Levi's. So uh, within jackets, uh, yeah. put yeah. technology that can actually control something. Yeah, uh, that's are, Those are like the fr- first few steps. But of course, it, it would be even better if you can like project it on your skin or whatever. So you always have it with yeah. you yeah um do, do you think like things like uh implants will become a thing in that at that mo- moment definitely yeah yeah, yeah. i think the, the 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 first most likely candidate would be a a, a contact lens with built-in ar capabilities mm. so right now i mean we, we've We're seen, the, we've, seen the google, <laughs> we've seen the google glass yeah, yeah, yeah it wasn't it yeah uh you, you might have, have tested the the microsoft hololens interesting uh, but obviously nobody's going to... No, too big, t- uh, too bulky, uh, the battery is failing you, etc., etc. Um, so slowly we're, we're moving in the direction and it's going to get extremely much miniaturized and it's going to get so small that you'll just pop it in your eye and then mm. you would have instant uh, uh, um, augmented reality and every type of processing coming with it. So like the, the minority report, uh, IDs... yeah. Ah, they're gonna become reality. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, amazingly, um, uh, um, science fiction uh, uh, um, uh, movies have been a, a pretty good indicator predictor, of, indicator yeah. of what's gonna come yeah. in terms of technology. Yeah, yeah. So I think in, in ter- and and obviously uh, from from a health perspective, uh, well, it's Philips is already very much experimenting with with swallowing small 
actually small laboratories. You en- they enter into your body mm. and they'll just collect whatever necessary Data. information and, and even might release the, the right amount of medicine while they travel through your body. That's crazy, yeah. Uh, that's definitely going to happen. Mm. And, and, and pretty, pretty soon, I think. Uh, uh, when I look at in our lifetime, at least. And, and, yeah, um, I think so too. Yeah. In, in the next I'm 29, so okay. probably. Well, you, have a good, <laughs> you have a good chance. Yeah, have a good uh, chance. That I'll, no, I'll but in, in the next that, yeah. uh, 10 to 25 years, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and, because and I think that, that will, it will explode. Uh, the, 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 the possibilities will explode on on types of interactions we'll be able to handle. Yeah, it might be difficult for our brains to deal with it. Mm. I mean, uh, if if I call you on the phone, uh, well, we've got a custom that I can hear you, and I I, I know you're not next to me, so we process this in yeah. our brain. Yeah, but we also know that that uh, some new technologies they they'll scare the living daylights out of us. Yeah, <laughs> some will be in your room. <laughs> yeah, if you, if, if you, if you suddenly have a hologram next to you, okay, is this guy really here or not? And yeah, is that, he looking at me or not? And can he have, see everything I do or not? Yeah, yeah. So that raises some privacy issues, of course. Privacy uh, issues, and and yeah, they're 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 going to be yeah. as much experiments on the technological side as they're going to be on the psychological side mm, how course. are we able to deal with all this technology yeah so that's the and that that's and tying it back to 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 the landscape we as mirabeau landed in uh, part of cognizant is for example also a company called red associates it's mm-hmm. a danish company okay and it's a company completely filled with sociologists anthropologists these people look at it from a pure human perspective. So yeah. they'll try to figure out what does it mean when I give something to you, when I hand you a physical object? What does that, that do in, 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 your in, brain, our, yeah. in, our, in our brain? Does it trigger any chemical reactions? How does it influence the relationship we have? And how do you take these very basic human uh, functions and, and make sure you make use of them or at least take them into account when you start thinking about new applications, about new types of user interaction. Mm. I, think, I think one of the biggest issues that we have with moving forward in that, uh, in that respect is the whole energy thing. So having, uh, yeah. having something power it without being it from a wall plug uh-huh. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's the biggest pro- problem, I think, within... Uh, Moving forward to that kind of technology, like Absolutely. implants and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah, we can't rely on battery power in that case, no. right? No, battery power is a intermediate station uh, in that respect. Uh, so, wow, um, um, there, there have been computations that the amount of energy that the sun is constantly projecting at the Earth is is more and more than enough to power anything on this Earth. Yeah, we just, just don't the, use it exactly. Efficiently, that's efficiently, yeah, and yeah. I mean, so so the, the the dream of of Elon Musk with, with Tesla, and not specifically with the cars, but but trend, uh, making use of the energy coming to us, their solar panels, and exactly and the like battery uh, factories, etc., yeah. uh, and and not bad, and batteries as a temporary storage for the energy comes coming in, which we want to use at a slightly different moment in time. Mm. Basically. I collect it today, and I want to use it this night. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that, in that sense, I do believe batteries are a great uh, invention, uh, but that we need to fix the problem of actually collecting all that energy that's coming to us. Yeah, and it, it, it reminds me of a podcast that I did a few podcasts ago with um, Unsense. So they kind of create uh, solar panels that can be designed. Uh-huh. So they can yeah. essentially create a facade of uh, solar exactly. panels, which makes buildings uh, energy producing instead of uh, yeah. consuming yeah. having the the whole facade of a, of a building which is now just plain glass mm. also having it produce energy yeah yeah and that's uh, and looking at the things like uh, what you said with the implants in for example your uh, as a lens or whatever mm-hmm. um there it's all <laughs> that's the that's the real real trick there is how are you going to get power to it because you need to be able to project it so it would have to come from yourself right something yeah, you but, but yourself. for example we blink yeah every blink is 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 a power transition yeah it's energy yeah it's energy so if you could use the blinking to charge the lens yeah 
Ah. Didn't think about that. That that's actually true because it's it's what you do with your watch as well, right? In, yeah, in some you, cases, you, you, you mechanical move, watches. For yeah, example. you you move your wrists and 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 that will charge your watch. Mm. And and think we as humans have on, on, or we, we we take food in. And we uh, we use that food to to power the body. Yeah, uh, we could use slightly uh, parts of that power, for example, to to power something like a lens in your eye. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I know. There's a uh, I think it's a Canadian professor who has already uh, already has designed and is also using a prototype of this lens. So it's really? it's already out there. Yeah, in a very basic form. Of course, but uh, that, that's how it always starts, right? And and we also know that that the time it took for for the mobile phone to uh, to mature and to be adapted was way and way shorter than the television, for example, mm. and before that for the car. So if this becomes mainstream technology, yeah, it's going to cut down in in years instead mm. of tens of years. So. To wrap up, I would uh-huh. like to ask you one final question. I okay. kind of ask everybody that. Um, but what are you most proud of? So what are you most proud of since you, uh, in maybe in the last 15 years since you uh, co-founded uh-huh. uh, Mirabeau? So w- what, what do you think the, the most, uh, the thing you're most proud of? What, what do you think it is? Um, it, it's, I think it's been able to make an impact in certain industries. Hmm. Uh, so, for example, we as Mirabeau uh, co-created uh, the first generations of Funda.nl, which was a real revela- revolution in, in the real estate industry in the Netherlands. Yeah. It was, wow, suddenly every bit of information was available at your fingertips on all houses in the Netherlands. Yeah. It was a real revolution. Funda is a real estate website where you can find all kinds of... Exactly. Well, actually, all kinds of houses and stuff like that, right? And and right now, it seems like a... Well, of course, mm. in, in 2001, yeah. it was not just a given. Mm. And, and then... Uh, being able to, uh, like I said earlier, to guide such a client over the years... And to be able to 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 be their conscience on on applying technology in the right sense, I think that for me makes that for some customers where I'm I've been involved in the last fifteen years, that's really something I'm really really proud of. That I I, I can be a part of their journey, mm. and that we've been able to establish establish a long term relationship where the partnership between. Uh, us as a service provider and their they as a customer has proved to be trustworthy and 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 long running mm. yeah i think that i think that's it's it's mostly uh, also the the impact that you can have on the client's client yeah, right exactly yeah that's the that's the the yeah. The, so the consumer, so uh, basically, I, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't get get a specific kick out out uh, out of of winning a new client. Obviously, it's it's great fun when you can conv- convince something. Hey, we're going to work for you. Mm. I get much more a kick when we're able to prolong that period for years and years. Yeah. And also building a company that can last for that amount exactly. of time, right? Exactly. I I, I always liked the 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 way. Uh, for example, Jason Fried uh, from Basecamp uh, uh-huh. says it is like um, they're not in the business of making a company that they want to just sell and that's it, right? Exactly. Uh, uh, it's more like okay, getting a company to a point where they can prolong even maybe your lifetime or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's a that's a really great way to to end the podcast. Um, for uh, the listeners, you can uh, find uh, Mirabeau on mirabeau.nl. I don't know if you have the p- dot .com one. Yeah, we have. Also the obviously. dot .com one. Um, and uh, you can find Bits vs. Bytes on uh, bitsvsbytes.com. Also uh, on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and SoundCloud. It's all Bits vs. Bytes. Thank you all for listening, and until next time. Bye.